Alrighty. Um, just like to say another short prayer for the word, blessing over the word of God. Father, uh, please minister your word to us now. Please anoint the speaking of your word and the listening to your word and the response of the heart to your word. Father God, uh, speak to us. Holy Spirit, uh, we give you permission to come and convict and teach and lead us and rule us through your word. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so anyone know what we're talking about today? Yeah, elders and leaders, church leadership. We're in the middle of our ser uh, mini sermon series on church leadership. And um, basically, this, this sermon series uh, of three parts, uh, we were praying about it this week, and I was feeling like it was becoming a bit clear what the three parts are. Okay, so, and this is a little bit retrospective because I didn't really clearly say this last week. But uh, the three parts are basically like this. Last week was like the attitude of a leader. <coughs> the attitude that a leader should have. And if you remember, we focused on that parable of uh, the talents. And we saw a difference in attitude between the good and faithful servant and the lazy and wicked servant. We thought about the attitude of the heart toward the master who entrusts us with uh, his good things and resources, including leadership. Um, and then today, I'm going to talk about the role or function of a leader. Okay, so what is the role of a leader in the context of the community and the body of Christ? And next week, Scott is going to be preaching about the qualifications of a leader. Okay, so we've got like attitude, function or role, and qualifications. And that's kind of how we're presenting this. And, you know, we're not going to be able to go into a lot of detail uh, because we're only doing a three-part, and then we're going to get into John's Gospel after that. Um, but um, basically, you know, there's a lot of things we can say, and beyond the scope of this of this series, we, it would also be really good to think about leadership in, like, the whole church, the entire body of Christ, the universal body. Um, but that would get us into a lot of conversations and things that are probably we can't handle, we definitely can't handle in a short three-week series. Like this, So we're just kind of focusing for the sake, partly practically, because we have this issue of seeking God's will for leadership in our local church community for 2016 and for the future here. Um, so for that reason, we're zooming in kind of narrowly. We're focusing on church leadership in the local church context. Okay? So um, why, why is there leadership in the church is the first question that I want to ask. Why is there even leadership anyway? And basically, I think we have to understand that in the context of Jesus' big picture of why he even came to earth in the first place. And I felt like there were some songs today, or something was going on where I felt like the Spirit was really communicating this to me again as we were worshiping and singing today, um, this, this same kind of message uh, that I wanted to share, which is basically, what was the purpose of Jesus' cross? You say, what was the purpose of Jesus' cross? Why did Jesus die on the cross? Just shout it out. What would you say? Oh, All right, that's going too far. Okay. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of... Anyone else have just a... Uh, because we're sinners, to forgive our sins, forgiveness of sins? Right. So, you know, we think about that in terms of God's reconciliation, uh, justice against... Um, sin and reconciliation, forgiveness, and all that kind of stuff it is really important. But that is like a means to the further goal, which uh, Kelly was getting us to, right? Is like uh, Jesus wanted a bride to be with him in eternity. And so the forgiveness of sins is not like an end in itself, in a sense. I mean, he wanted to actually redeem and bring his bride to purity and to partnership with him for all eternity. And that's what Jesus wants, and that's where all of history is going, you know, if we believe the Bible, what the Bible teaches about it. Um, so for that reason, I think Jesus, uh, or the Word of God says in Hebrews 12, 2, it tells us to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. It says that Jesus endured the cross for the joy set before him. 
And I believe that that joy was the joy of seeing his bride uh, freed, reconciled, redeemed, purified, and to be glorified with him as his eternal partner. Uh, you know, um, I don't want to go into this in too much detail right now, but um, when you think of how God made Eve from Adam, I think it's kind of a picture of how God made the bride from, from Jesus. Remember how uh, God took part of Adam's side out and then he made a woman from the man's side? Yeah, and then do you remember when Jesus was on the cross? What happened to Jesus' side? It was pierced, and then what flowed out? Blood and water, right? And you think about the church, and the church is created. God creates the church through the blood uh, of Jesus and through the water of repentance and baptism. So it's kind of a beautiful parallel that just like, I mean, all of history is a romance story, you know, of God. And, and this early romance with Adam and Eve, it kind of prefigures this ultimate romance that is the context of the whole of history of God and what God's doing. So I just want to say that's the big picture uh, in which we need to understand leadership. And then Christ came, and how did he do this? And how does he intend to prepare his bride? Um, I think that's clear from Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, the connect so I just want to make a connection here. Uh, when Christ came, Paul says he, he came bringing gifts and apportioning grace and giving gifts to the church. And it's in that context that he says, um, it was he, it was Christ, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of God. Amen. That's a pretty cool verse. So what's the purpose of giving these things? And here we have this five-fold ministry uh, list here, prophets, uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Um, why? Why did Christ give these? What was his intention? What, you know, what was the reason? Why are these gifts to the church? He says they're to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and we become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. I think that's exactly what we're talking about here in terms of the bride of Christ. Basically, to prepare the bride. That's why Christ gave these fivefold ministry functions to the church. Does that make sense to people? And among these, we can see um, pastors and teachers... Um, which I'm going to draw a connection now between especially the word pastor and the word elder and c in connection to leadership as a church. So I want us to get like a biblical concept of, because how many people here even really feel like you know what an elder is? Like a biblical description of an elder. Like n no one's really even confidently putting up their hand, right? Um, you know, we, we kind of know what a pastor is, because pastor is the more common term that we use for someone who's, who's in a leadership position in a church. Um, but these words, pastor, um, uh, sh pastor or shepherd, uh, which is basically the same, same word, pastor or shepherd, uh, and also elder and overseer, these three words refer to basically the same thing in scripture. And so I think that's helpful for us to look at that um, so I want to draw a connection between a few terms now, okay? Looking at a couple of key scriptures that link these together. The first one is from the book of Acts, because both Peter and Paul um, draw this connection. Okay, so if we look first at Paul's words to the elders in the church at Ephesus, recorded by Luke in the book of Acts. Okay, Acts 20, verse 28. And this is where Paul has gathered the elders of the church at Ephesus together to, t to give them a final farewell. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He's talking to them, right? And he gathers the elders of the church together um, to talk to them about some important things. And in his uh, uh, address to them, he says this, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, 
which he bought with his own blood. So there, in this passage, we see the connection between these three words. He's talking to the elders. He's gathered the elders together. And he says to the elders, the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Okay? Now, the word for elder in Greek is basically, I probably won't pronounce it right, but presbyteros. So if you've heard of pres- presbyter or presbyterian, right? That's where that comes from, elders. Okay? Church in terms of governance by elders. And then, if you know the word for overseers, it's episkopos. So there's episcopalians, episcopal church, and we kind of get that too, right? And that word gets translated in English also as bishop. Okay, overseers, bishop. Okay, so we've got pres- presbyter, uh, overseer, bishop, elder, pastor, shepherd. All of those words are all tied together in this in this verse, uh, in a, and if you see it in its context. And then. Uh, Paul, uh, sorry, Peter does the same thing. So if you look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1 to 4, um, uh, Peter says, To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder. Okay, so there you get that presbyteros word again, to the elders among you. I appeal as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's sufferings, and one who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock. And that's where you get that word that else, it's related to a word that is translated as pastor or shepherd. Okay, be shepherds of God's flock that's under your care, serving as overseers. There's that word episkopos again. Okay, so, uh, and and then he gives uh, details about this, right? Not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be, not greedy for money, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. So there again, we see these connections between these terms, okay? Uh, Overseer, shepherd, and elder. And they refer to the same thing. They're the same position within the context of a local church, okay? I don't think you're finding that helpful, but I found this helpful to see a a bit of a connection here. And... um, And so that's what I want to talk about today is basically the role of this person or people. uh, Usually it's referred to in the the plural as a body of elders. And that's what we're praying for as a church, that God will establish elders in this church community. That's our big prayer topic. So if you haven't been praying for that, I would really urge and encourage you to pray to God that he will establish elders. Okay, because we're trying to follow a biblical model of church leadership and governance. Um, now, with the last part of this here, uh, when it says, when the chief shepherd appears, you'll receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. I want to talk about that a bit, because um, we can see that human beings are called shepherds, but we see also that Jesus is called the chief shepherd. And so, when we think about leadership in the church, the first thing that we have to be aware of is that Jesus is Really, Jesus is the leader. Jesus is the head of the church. Okay, and no discussion of human leadership is going to ever take away, it should not take away in any sense from that leadership of Christ over the church. And so I just want to say that the first, I want to call it, just because I'm, I'm doing this business ethics thing and I'm thinking about economics and stuff, the first fundamental theorem of church leadership, okay, is this. Uh, Christ rules us through his spirit and his word. That's also one of our churches, that's our church's first core value. If you're not familiar with our church's core values, they're up there on the wall at the back. There's a piece of paper on the wall there. And they're also on our website. You can read them. Okay, but Christ rules us through his spirit and his word. And the basic Christian confession can be summed up really, really simply in the few words, Jesus Christ is Lord. That's the basic Christian confession. Jesus Christ is Lord. And of course, there's much more that we believe and that we need to unpack out of that. But Jesus Christ is Lord. Part of what that means is that I'm not the Lord of myself. And none of us are as Christians. We are not the boss of ourselves. You know, and I I like saying this, and my kids like saying this, you're not the boss of me, right? You're not the boss of me. But... You are not the boss of yourself if you're a Christian. 
You have been bought at a price. You belong to somebody else. We're called to live for him who died for us. The one who gave up his life for us, we are now to live not for ourselves, but for him. He's our Lord. And we are supposed to be following him, right? We follow Jesus. We're a community of disciples. We are followers of Christ. We seek to be obedient to him above all else. As he himself sought to be completely obedient to the Father. And so he gave us this example of obedience. And so we obey Jesus Christ as Lord. That's, that's what we should be doing. And that is just like above everything else that we're going to say about leadership. We have to fix that, that truth in mind, like really clearly. Okay? Otherwise, leaders would become idols. Okay? Uh, you're not supposed to worship your leaders. There is a sense in which we follow and listen to our leaders, but above all of it is Christ. And our ultimate allegiance is to Christ himself. So Jesus Christ is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And part of what that is interesting about that is that Christ is the is the King and He's the Lord, but He's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That means there's like other kings and lords. But Christ is like a level above and beyond all of that. But then underneath Christ's lordship, there's like this level of leadership that's going on. And that's kind of what we're trying to look at and understand and how, how can that work. But none of it can hold together at all if that first basic thing is not there. And, and you know, it can't and it won't hold together if that basic truth of Jesus as Lord isn't there. Uh, similarly, uh, Jesus Christ is the good shepherd. And Jesus uh, also says in John ten sixteen. He says, there's only one flock, and there's only one shepherd. Yeah? Can we, can we see that one? John 10, 16. And Jesus is talking about the church, and, and he says, I have other sheep that are not of the sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice. There shall be one flock and one shepherd. So in a very real sense, there's one shepherd. There's one shepherd, and that's Jesus. But somehow that doesn't hold Jesus back from calling other uh, Christians shepherds, too, and uh, raising them up as shepherds. And Jesus, when you look at what he did in his ministry, the main focus that he did was like raising up these 12 apostolic leaders who would be the shepherds of the church, and he, he taught them to shepherd the church. He did a lot more than that, but that was, that was his major focus, and that's kind of how he turned things over when he was done. Uh, I mean, when he ascended into heaven, when he was done on earth for now. And then, not only that, but then he sent his Holy Spirit to be present among them, right? And so again, like, their only authority and legitimacy is as they're following the Spirit of God. So it's really not, not about us, ultimately, but somehow it is about us within how it, uh, it's about Christ. So I want to talk about pastors and shepherds. How do you guys feel about um, the idea of uh, thinking of ourselves as sheep. Do you like that? Do you like being thought of as sheep? Um, I think some people can be offended by the shepherd sheep metaphor. Well, I know that they. I know that they can, and especially German people. Well, I'm just saying that because I've talked to some German people that I know are particularly offended by that. But um, you know, in the literal shepherd sheep relationship, you have what you have going on is a relationship between members of two different species, right? There's like, there's like the shepherd that's a human being, and then there's the sheep that's an animal, like a non-human animal, um, and not even a particularly great animal. I mean, in the sense of being particularly smart or, you know, wise or strong. Like a sheep is pretty, pretty dumb, pretty helpless. Uh, uh, if sheep are left on their own, they pretty much will end up being lost, um, sick, and or dead it, if they don't have a shepherd. That's the kind of animal that a sheep is. They're completely dependent on, this other, uh, on their shepherd. Now, when we think about that in relation to God, it's not that bad, right? Because God, okay, I mean, God is like, the, actually, the difference between us and God is way more than the difference between a human being and a sheep, as far as, like, you know, the difference that separates those. So applied to God, the Lord is my shepherd, yes, no problem, right? 
But now we try to apply this in a human context. You're like, what? Shepherd? And that means there's like sheep and there's like shepherds. How do we think about this? Is this, how can we think about this? How is this not kind of traumatic to think about? Are you trying to say that the shepherd or the pastor is like a, like a human and I'm like an animal and I'm just like a dumb sheep that I just got to like go wherever my shepherd tells me to go and think and do whatever my shepherd says or something like that, you know? And basically my answer to that would be no. And so we have to be really careful when we use this metaphor and we try to understand what's going on in church leadership. And I think that's why, again, I would want to point to this fact that church leadership can only happen under this umbrella of Christ as the real shepherd. Christ is the chief shepherd. He is the the only ultimately good shepherd. But somehow he chooses to exercise his shepherding partly through human uh, human beings vis-a-vis each other. And it's kind of, uh, it's interesting that he chooses to call us, call, call us that or to, to use those terms for human beings. So in what sense can a human being be a shepherd? I think the way, the way I like to think about it is uh, that a human shepherd or pastor is supposed to have an influence over other people. And there's a kind of God-ordained place of influence there. And the influence is, my understanding, is pretty much just to help people get closer to Jesus. So the influence should be in the direction of Jesus. But there is a guidance that needs that, that's there, right? And God institutes that. There's a kind of guidance, there's a kind of influence that happens as, as the leader uh, guides and influences people to go deeper and further in their walk with God. And you can think about it in what John the Baptist says. He, he says, I'm just a friend of the bridegroom, right? I'm not the bridegroom. The bridegroom is Jesus. I'm a friend of the bridegroom. And I rejoice when the bride goes away from me, because that's what was happening in that context. People are leaving John's ministry. They were going to follow Jesus. And some of his disciples were like, Lord, everyone's leaving us. Everyone's going to follow this guy. And John was like, I'm just a friend of the bridegroom. I'm really happy about this. And they were like, what? Your ministry is like falling apart. It's like everyone's leaving you. No, this is what is supposed to happen. This is the way it's supposed to go. And I'm full of joy because of this. You know, so like in that sense, as leaders, we have this influence and we exercise this guidance, but it's toward Jesus. It's to help the bride come closer to Jesus, uh, who is their true Lord. But that pointing to Jesus and guiding toward Jesus and influence, that should be done with zeal and diligence, you know, and it's authority, but relative authority, okay, but still relative authority to point people and lead people to Jesus. And that's basically what I think an elder or a shepherd, a pastor, an overseer is supposed to do. But I want to break it down to uh, the function of a leader a little bit more carefully and I want to suggest, and I, I wish I would have gotten to the point of making some PowerPoints here or, uh, or having this on a whiteboard or something for you to see, but I'm just going to list five points, okay, for those of you who are taking notes, and I'm going to break down each of those a little bit. Um, so Christ gave the church shepherds, as we read in Ephesians f- uh, 4. Christ gave the church shepherds. What are shepherds supposed to do for the flock or the people of God? Um, okay, first, taking care of taking care of those entrusted to you. Second, feeding them. Okay? Third, watching over them. Fourth, going ahead of them as an example to follow. And fifth, laying down your life for them. And I just want to suggest that if you're looking at how the role of an elder or pastor or overseer is described in scripture, those five points don't perfectly exhaust it, but they're, they're five solid points that you need to understand if you're understanding what scripture says about the role of, of one of these uh, people. Okay? Now, taking care of God's flock. <coughs> taking care of. What does that mean? Taking care of them. Um, I think it breaks down clearly into five sub points. Okay? So if you're taking notes, you can, I know this is kind of complicated. That's why I should have had a PowerPoint. But Okay, and I'm just getting these from Ezekiel. Ezekiel 34, 1 to 10, where God is rebuking the shepherds of Israel. 
okay? And this term, shepherd and, and elder, these terms are across. They're used in the Jewish community in the Old Testament. They're also used again in the New Testament. When you look at the word elder in the New Testament, it's sometimes just talking about the elders within the Jewish community, the, the leaders in the church community, or in the, sorry, in the Jewish community in the, in, the New Te- in the New Testament times. And sometimes it's referring, especially later on, as the church grew and developed to leaders in the, the Christian church, which was part Jewish and part Gentile. But taking care of God's flock, okay? Ezekiel 34, 1 to 10. Um, can we see the first part of that? Just to have a reference up here on for people who don't have their Bibles with them. Ezekiel 34. I don't know if I listed that one out for Michael, actually. But basically what, uh, what God says there is, you have not. These are like you have nots, what you have not done. And God's mad at them for not doing this. Um, strengthening the weak. Healing the sick, binding up the injured, bringing back the strays, and searching for the lost. Okay? That's a pastoral, a shepherd heart to do those things. Uh, There's one thing that he says there explicitly that a, a, a shepherd is not supposed to do. That's to rule over them harshly and brutally. But that's what they were doing. Right? That's what the shepherds were doing. And they weren't doing all those other things that they were supposed to be doing. So God was angry, and he basically said, you know what, I'm just going to come and do it myself. And all you shepherds, I'm just going to, you're done. And I'm going to come myself and do it. And I think that was Jesus, you know, basically. So again, right, it's pointing to Jesus. And human beings are never going to be able to perfectly do what only God can really do. But nevertheless, we're somehow called to do this. And so... Um, All right, I want to just break it down. So I'm saying five major points, and that was the first point. The other ones will be a little bit more brief, okay? Um, Second one, feeding God's flock. What's going on there? Well, I started talking about this last week. This is nourishing, right? Leading them to pasture. That's what a, a shepherd does, right? He takes the sheep out, and he brings them to the places where there's good grass, good pasture to eat, where there's not, like, poisonous weeds and things like that that they would indiscriminately eat. And also, the shepherd has a way of kind of moving the sheep around on the different places in the pastures because the sheep will just eat the grass all the way right down to the roots and totally destroy the pasture if they're not kind of carefully moved around on the pasture. Okay, so what does this have to do? Well, we're talking about how food is the word of God. So basically, giving people the word of God, um, cooking it up like a nice uh, stir-fry, Set, right and and serving it and here's the word of God for you to eat right that's what that's what a shepherd should do as well and then I think also praying for them well I was thinking about this isn't exactly scriptural but definitely a shepherd should pray for them and I thought about it metaphorically it's kind of like assisting their digestion right pray for them so they'll have good digestion of the word the word of God uh, watching over God's flock what does this involve well here I like uh, Ezekiel 33. Uh, where it talks about God is telling Ezekiel, you're a watchman. You're a watchman, right? Watching over, overseeing. Those are all connected, okay? It's overseeing, watching over. What does this involve? Well, in that chapter, uh, Ezekiel 33, God talks uh, and says, if you see danger, right? You're appointed on this wall. You're supposed to be watching out. And if you see like a sword coming or any kind of danger and you don't warn people about what's coming, I'm going to hold you accountable for their blood. Now, if you warn them and they choose not to listen to you, then okay, they're dying, but you're not responsible anymore. But as a watchman, you are to warn. You're to be on the lookout for danger for the people and warn them, right? So this function of warning um, is important, and I think that's part of what watching over is about. Okay, then the, uh, the last two being examples to God's flock, I think that's pretty straightforward. But, uh, for example, 1 Timothy 4.16 talks about watching your life and doctrine carefully. So very careful. A leader should be paying very, very careful attention to themselves and their own life and their own doctrine and belief. Okay, because it's through persevering in those things, uh, Paul writes to Timothy, that you'll be able to also Uh, help others to be saved if you're persevering deeply in these things in yourself. So there's this kind of higher standard of accountability 
uh, about my own life and practice, if I'm supposed to be a leader that comes along with that, and being examples of God's flock. And then finally, laying down your life for God's flock. Okay, well that to me speaks to servantship. Um, so letting your time, your energy, your resources be dictated, not primarily by your own wants and desires, but by the needs of others. If you're a servant, what does it mean to be a servant? You know, This means you've got a master, you've got somebody else basically telling you what to do, and you don't get to decide so much for yourself. Okay. Now, of course, Christ says, you're my servants, but you're also my friends, and I would even rather call you friends than servants, but there's still a lot about being servants of God, too. We're clearly called to be servants as leaders, and Jesus talks about that. And again, I'll just put a plug in here for my, my blog where I've been developing these ideas. Leadership. I've got 10 posts up there, which I'd love it if people in our community would be reading and engaging with and responding to me if you think things are good or not so good or, you know, how is it relevant um, would be awesome. But I'm, I develop a lot of these ideas there, too. Okay. So that's kind of a summary of what's the function of a leader. Um, just, just I'll lay them out again quickly um, so you remember them easily. Taking care of those entrusted to you, feeding them, watching over them, going ahead of them as an example to follow, and laying down your life for them. I think that pretty much covers what a leader is supposed to do. And this, this function in the body of Christ that's called an elder uh, uh, or a, a pastor or an overseer, that's what it's basically talking about. So... Um, there's just a few other things that I want to talk about here as to why they're important. Because you might be asking, yeah, okay, well, description of elders, but why, why are they important? Why do they matter? I'm just going to give you a quick couple more passages to think about here. Okay, importance of elders. Titus 1.5. Okay, in Titus 1.5, Paul is talking to Titus, and he says, the reason why I left you on Crete was so that you might finish, you might straighten out what was left unfinished, and appoint elders in every town. Okay? So Paul, the apostle, was talking to Titus, who was working with him as, you know, a leader and kind of apostolic guy um, in the church. And he said, it's not finished. What needs to be set up there for the church to be functioning well isn't finished until there's elders. Appoint elders in every town. Okay? So, and then similarly, in Acts chapter 14, verse 23... Uh, it says that Paul and Barnabas, they went out and they were doing this, functioning again apostolically. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in every church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. So they appointed elders in every church. That means every church is supposed to have elders according to the New Testament pattern. You know, uh, just kind of going, you know, I mean, it's kind of, simplistic in a sense to just go right to scripture and say it, but basically that's the scriptural pattern. It's pretty clear. There's supposed to be elders. There's supposed to be a body of elders in every church and in every town where the church is growing. Um, another couple quick points here. Um, Acts 15.6. When there was a huge thing in the church where people weren't sure about the church moving from the Jewish roots to also incorporate Gentiles and what requirements should be demanded of Gentiles. Some people were going, they got to be circumcised. And, uh, and so this was a huge controversy in the church about how to navigate this incorporation of Greeks, Gentiles, into the people of God together with the Jews. And so there's this huge thing. And how did they make the decision? How did they make a decision on what the policy was going to be? They gathered the elders, the elders and the apostles together were the ones who met in council, uh, had a lot of discussion and debate and prayed into it, and they came to realize what was going on, and then they sent a message out to the church to be conveyed to the whole church to com communicate what the, what the policy should be here. Okay, so decision-making, policy, about important things like that, it, it happens with elders um, and also apostles are involved. Um, one other, uh, 1 Timothy 5.17. Um, the elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. So there you can see a uh, few things. The one I want to focus on is that elders are supposed to direct the affairs of the church. Okay, they're directing the affairs of the church. They're, they're guiding what the church is focusing on, what we're supposed to be 
up to and what we're doing, that's, that's a task that's given to the elders to do. Um, and part of the way that they do that is preaching and teaching. Um, but, but, interestingly, that's not the only way. So not all elders necessarily preach and teach, according to this verse as well. There's different kinds of elders. Um, okay, so, um, importance of elders, final point on this, and then I just have a few uh, take-home lessons to share with you. Um, why is an elder so important? Well, a big part of what it's focusing on, and this is relating to that feeding with the, with the word, but also of guidance and preaching and teaching, this kind of stuff, is that there needs to be a secured, solid doctrine. Okay, there's a huge concern all the way through the New Testament with solid doctrine and with guarding the good deposit that was entrusted by Christ and by the apostles. Um, this good deposit or solid doctrine is basically the gospel. That's what we're talking about here. And what's the gospel? It is the power of God for the salvation of all who believe. So this is not a small matter, right? It's like, oh, yeah, maybe we'll have like the gospel or maybe we'll have something else or we'll have a different kind of gospel or something like that. Paul was really intense about this. And in Galatians, he said, even if there's an eternal angel that comes to you, like in this angelic glory and preaches to you a different gospel than the one we proclaimed, or even if we ourselves come to you and start doing that, let them be eternally condemned, he says, emphatically, right? Let them be eternally condemned if they're trying to give you another gospel than the one we proclaimed, right? The gospel is the power of God, and it needs to be guarded. And all over the church, there was like this false teaching and false doctrine, false gospel was being proclaimed. You read it in all of the New Testament. Like, there's hardly any of it that you can read without seeing that come in, that there's this concern about this. So that's also what the elders are supposed to do. They're supposed to be uh, guarding this, and I think of it just as food, right? It's like, what kind of food are you giving people? People need the gospel. They need to eat the gospel, not some other kind of food that you might think is good or want to prepare for them that would actually make them sick to their stomach, make them get bloated, poisonous in the end, right, and ends up dying and weak. But the gospel that empowers and strengthens people. And as we were going through this, I would love to read this with you. I know it's, in a way, a bit of a digression here, but could we look at Titus together? Because I didn't even know this passage existed. And I thought of Titus as mostly like all these rules and stuff about, about leadership and all right, kind of boring. But there's this amazing statement of the gospel that I just want to draw your attention to because I was like, this is so beautiful. It's right in the middle of this little, little epistle to Titus that Paul wrote. It's in Titus chapter 3, uh, verse 3 to... Uh, basically uh, seven. And this is right at the core of what, what is this all about? What are we trying to, why are all these things about leaders and that Titus is working out here? And, and, and Paul does a similar thing in Timothy. I, I love that passage. It's so beautiful. Such a beautiful presentation of the gospel. That's what it's about. You know, that's why there need to be um, elders basically because of the gospel of God, because of this, the beauty of this message of Christ Jesus that God ha has given to us, and that this would be emphasized and strengthened. And, you know, it's so interesting. I'm like, I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good, right? Doing what is good, devoted to doing good works, good deeds, okay? How would that happen? by emphasizing, stressing that we are not saved by our works. We are not saved by anything that we do, anything that we can do. But we are justified freely by his grace through Jesus Christ. Like, it's all here. Like The whole gospel is here in this beautiful summary of what God has done. And I love this, how it just describes how naturally, without the gospel, what, how do we end up? It's just like, well, we're foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We live in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. It's kind of how we get, right? Uh, 
without the gospel, but when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, everything changed, you know? And it's like, oh, that is the gospel. That is the message of God. That is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. And so, uh, you know, uh, yeah, that's the food that the elders are supposed to be cooking up. So if you've got elders who aren't cooking up that food, you've got to talk to them. Something's got to happen, right? Because that's, that's trouble. Um, okay. Um, Take-home lessons. Firstly, I just wanted to suggest to you, and I really wish I had made a PowerPoint of this one, but it's basically a decision-making model for the church, okay? And how the church, because see, we can all make, we all live and make our own decisions, and we have our beliefs and our attitudes and our feelings, and we act, and we do things. And that's cool as individuals. But as a community, we also do that. We also act corporately. And when we, that's part of what God is doing, right? It's saying like he brings people together, and then we can act corporately. So how do we... Um, uh, what do we focus on? What do we do together, acting together as a community? Um, how do we direct our communal resources? Okay, and how do we decide that? Well, I want to suggest this model that basically um, the elders are supposed to have uh, charge of that in the local church. But I would say, so in my model here, what I have is the elders, okay, they, they are doing this, but they have relationships with, on the one hand, apostles, and on the other hand, members, okay? And in the members category, I would put a subcategory of prophets. Does that make sense? So there's this, like, feedback relationship going on between apostles and elders. Accountability, discussion, wisdom happening there. And then there's also this feedback relationship between members and elders, including prophets and elders, okay? So discussion, accountability, and wisdom happening there too. Over all of it is Christ and the Holy Spirit who are pouring in the treasures of, uh, and riches of wisdom and knowledge. And that's happening just directly to those who are in apostolic, ap apostolic function, those who are in elders function, those who are members, those who are prophets, okay? All that's going on, governed by Christ, overseeing the whole thing, and then there's this feedback decision, but when that's happening, then the elders need to make a, a decision. Somehow the community needs to decide what to focus on, how to act, what do we do, where do we use our resources, how do we make these decisions? And I think the elders are supposed to do that. Okay, I mean, now then, once those decisions have been made with all the due process of discussion and accountability and feedback, now the, the church as a whole, we can act corporately and we can direct our resources, our time, our money our whatever we have, okay, towards acting so that God's kingdom would come and we would love the Lord our God with all that we are as individuals, also as a whole community. So I think prayer is really key to that at all levels and open channels of communication is crucial, okay, between all those components. But are you guys getting, is this okay coming across to you a little bit what I think the scriptural pattern of elders is? I really want us to get involved in a discussion of this to have a clear concept, and we are praying towards elders. We don't know if God will establish clearly a body of elders um, really soon, or it might take a while. We're not sure. We're praying into it, but we want to really pray into it because I think there's God's wisdom. I mean, it says that Christ came giving gifts to the church, apportioning grace, and it was he who gave these to the church. It's his idea, right? So if we have a different idea... Um, then Christ's idea, it's probably not going to work that well. I mean, he's the one who's in charge, and he decided to do that. So I'd like to invite you to, um, you know, I didn't even talk about deacons, but the whole deacons discussion is really important here too, and deacons are leaders. I just want to say that a deacon is very similar to an elder, except it's like in a more specific functionality. So rather than kind of overarching the whole community, a, a deacon is a leader, but of a sort of sub-ministry sub within the church. And that, um, so for example, in Acts chapter 6, verse 1 to 6, we see a selection of, of deacons 
who were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they were put in charge of this very important issue uh, that needed to be taken care of. Um, okay, so, yeah, so I would want us to also be extending our prayer and thought into deacons as well, elders and deacons. Okay, let's hear take-home lessons. All right, pray for your leaders. Pray for your leaders. Um, Christ has desired to bring benefits to us through our leaders. So we should pray for our leaders. They have extra work to carry. They have burdens to carry for you, for us, right? Secondly, um, pray for Christ to give us, as a community, the gift of elders. Because we haven't been clearly functioning with a, a well-defined body of elders. We want to go in that direction. It's been okay. I mean, God has been doing his things here. But I think he wants to take us to that next step. And I, again, I don't know how long it'll take, but uh, hopefully by the end of this year, at the latest, this will be kind of figured out for us. And thirdly, um, I want to talk briefly about obeying your leaders and submitting to their authority. Actually, I want to look at Hebrews 13, 17. And I'm just going to end on this point. Okay? This verse I felt was really ringing out to me, even though I just, I don't like this verse. To be honest, like, this verse kind of makes my skin crawl. But I think it's important, and I felt like God wanted me to talk about it. It says, Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. Interesting that Christ puts people in a place where they have to give an account to God for other people, for what's going on with other people. Like, I'm like, why would anyone want this? I not only have to give an account to God for myself, but also for other people that I'm, that I'm influencing. Is this a good thing that I want, that I want to have? Like, this, what a, you know, I find it hard even to, like, relate to people. And, you know, what about how are the people going to react? Or how does this happen? Or what is, you know, all kinds of questions that come up here. But they keep watch over you as men who must give an account. That's why you're supposed to submit to their authority and obey them. Because so their work will not be, be a burden, but be a joy. And what is their work again? It's, it's giving the food of the gospel. And it's giving guidance to where you're supposed to go to have really healthy food and to be strengthened and to be alive. And it's trying to convey what Christ's directionality is for the local church. Well, let's say, you know, what would be our, your other options instead of obeying your leaders? So let's say that the leaders go through this feedback process. They're being accountable, uh, responsible to apostles. They're being accountable, responsible to the whole members. They're living in this kind of heightened expectation of themselves, watching over their own life. And they're doing all that stuff. They go through this process deeply in prayer, deeply in communication, they find a direction for the church, and they kind of talk about that, right? Uh, well, what are you going to do? Are you going to follow that, that direction, or are you going to do something else, you know? Well, the idea is that if you don't follow the direction, it will become very burdensome for them, and it won't be of any advantage to you. Because if that's really what's happening, that Christ is, like, exercising his guidance and governance through human leaders and we're deciding to not listen to or follow or submit th to those human leaders, it's not going to be advantage to you to do it. Again, right? I mean, I find this, this is a really hard thing to talk about because of the way that uh, we think about leadership and authoritarianism and, man, I am my own boss. Like, if there's one thing that culturally is in place, it's that I'm my own boss. So, to listen to somebody else, I have to submit to someone else. That's really hard to even think of. Um, but, you know, we're not really submitting to this other person. We're submitting to Christ because it was his idea to put these people in charge. And maybe they're jerks and maybe they're dumb, right? But for the sake of Christ, we're supposed to submit to them. Weird, right? Wouldn't it be better to just kick them in the butt and, like, just walk out and do my own thing instead? Why would Christ want this, you know? Well, I know I, I don't want There's a lot more that we could say here. But um, please pray for <laughs> leaders in our church. Please pray for us to obey uh, Jesus and follow his pattern and teaching. 
And please engage in this, because as we are in this thing as a community, God will bring about things in a much better way, much more effectively and healthily if we're praying, if we're all praying and engaging and asking for him to do this uh, for us.